for Christmas. Why not give your family and friends something unforgettable? A cavalcade of songs, 46 of the greatest classic standards from the 1950s to the 1990s by one of the most dramatic, versatile singers alive today. Take a breath, close your eyes, but only for a moment. Here is the amazing Patricia Welch with the perfect Christmas gift for family and friends. Music for Great Entertaining introduces cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia Welch. Whatever Lola wants. Three hours of continuous music, the perfect accompaniment to an elegant dinner party. 46 of the all time classic standards, spanning decades of hit songs. Sung by Patricia Welch, a soprano with an amazing four octave range. Take the guesswork out of what music to play at your next dinner party. Going to a friend's home for dinner? Cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia also makes the perfect hostess gift. Three hours of great music, all digitally recorded. Singer Andy Williams says, Patricia has a gorgeous voice and always thrills the audience. Las Vegas entertainer Wayne Newton is also a fan. Sometimes the sun goes around. This is Johnny Blue Star. Welcome to Threshold, a global media event. Is the universe just a random dance of atoms, or is it a manifestation of a supremely intelligent architect? Can its purpose, or our purpose here on Earth, be adequately assessed? Can we commune with it, know its intentions, cooperate with its direction? Here, we define Threshold as a gateway state of awareness allowing mankind to cross into a place of real cognition. Threshold allows us to approach questions of higher reality through the door of experience rather than mere belief. Welcome to Threshold, where we tear away the veil from commercial media, bringing our audience and participants into another realm of reality and enhanced communication. Welcome to today's broadcast, Patricia. Thank you, Johnny. It's a pleasure to be here with your Threshold program. Before we begin to preview some of the songs in your album and penetrate a bit into their extraordinary history, let's review a bit about your own personal history that equipped you to pull off such a massive, artistically challenging project as Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia. A 46-song, three-CD collection spanning the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Let us go back to the very beginning and tell us about the start of your interest in singing and a bit about the circumstances in which you grew up as a child. Okay. Um, actually, I uh, grew up very humble beginnings in West Virginia, and I've always loved music from, from being a little child. And I remember my mom... And Dad had a lot of old Broadway records, Gordon McRae, Shirley Jones, so forth. And I used to listen to these constantly. And, and I, I just had such a desire to be a part of that world. And in high school, our uh, high school was a consolidated school. Even though I grew up in a small town, they took three towns and combined them and made this wonderful high school. And we had a great fine arts program. And so I just loved loved singing and I got involved in the musicals and and uh, I even walked home after school was three and a half miles during the time that we were in rehearsals for musicals which was always in the spring and uh, from then on it just it stayed with me and um, you know I think when you have that desire that burning desire and that interest of deep interest in something it stays with you for your life well after high school 
what happened with your work in college? And, and tell us something about your operatic training. Well, I actually uh, I was a scholarship winner at West Virginia University. So they gave out one voice scholarship a year, and I was it. So I was very fortunate to have that. And I studied with a uh, former Metropolitan Opera Spinto, Frances Yind, who actually taught at West Virginia University. She was an elderly woman, but she was a wonderful lady, and, a, and she was, you know, Metropolitan Opera Spinto, which is kind of a voice that's kind of a spin of a soprano, very like a full lyric spin. Anyway, she, she taught me in college, and uh, I continued, just as I did in high school, to be involved in the fine arts department, the musicals, the operas, anything that I could be a part of, I was a part of it. <laughs> so, so there was some dramatic training there too, right? It yes. wasn't just music. Yes, exactly. It was acting, and it was music, and it was opera, and it was, you know, everything all tied in. You know how the arts are just so much interconnected. <laughs> yes, they are. Mm -hmm. At what point did you decide that you wanted to actually be a professional singer? I think I decided that really in college. I, you know, that's where I, what the direction that I was going. But when I took that real leap was when I went to New York City for the first time, and which was I was in my mid twenties, and um, that's when I really said. I'm going to take this leap and do it. You know, some people move to other uh, parts of the world just out of the, well, I, that, that was kind of it for me. You know, I came from West Virginia, and here I was going to New York City all by myself. So that was a big step. Well, I know, because I went to New York City, too, later on in my after, uh, after college. Mm -hmm. And I went to Columbia for a while. And, uh, it was like a really important point, because at that point I wanted to be a writer, but I was also writing some songs and things like that. But uh, it was a different, I was more caught up in trying to get films and books made than, than songs at that point. But still, it's like a mecca. Yes. And, you know, it's so, the, the culture there is just so wonderful. I mean, you know, that's what New York is all about. You know, you've got the libraries and you have Broadway and you have, you know, the literature, you've got everything there as far as our culture goes. Yes, it's a it's a wonderful place to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, there's there's one of your songs whose title kind of defines the tremendous personal aspirations that the human heart can contain, but is also a very fascinating little love song. It's called "Fly Me to the Moon," and it had a revival in the opening title of Wall Street with Michael Douglas, Martin, and Charlie Sheen. But the song had a stunning success story way before that when it was first released as in other words if you remember the lyrics of course you do but uh in other words hold my hand but anyway it was first called in other words it was released by k ballad in 1954 but went on from there yes what? and actually uh k ballard was the original singer for the song back in 1960 peggy lee recorded the song and that made it more popular when she performed it on uh, the Ed Sullivan Show, which, you know, the Ed Sullivan Show back then was kind of like our American Idol today. You know, a lot of people, big stars were, were became big, people became big stars from the Ed Sullivan Show. So that song was so popular, and it became better known as Fly Me to the Moon. So in 1963, Peggy Lee convinced Bart Howard to actually make the name change official from, in other words, to Fly Me to the Moon. <laughs> And then in 1960s, you know, in the early 1960s, the version of the song was released under the new name. And so many singers, including Nat King Cole, Sarah Vaughn, Brenda Lee, Connie Francis. Connie Francis even did a non-English version of it. Frank Sinatra recorded it. So, you know, it became a really big, big hit. And uh, Bart Howard, who was the writer, estimated that by the time Frank Sinatra covered the song in 1964... More than a hundred versions had been recorded, and by 1995, it had been recorded more than 300 times. That's a pretty good success story for a song. <laughs> I, I, I would say so, but let's yeah. hear it. Spring is like on Jupiter and Mars In 
tell me, Patricia, what, why do you think, I mean, now we've, we have handled some of its history, which is quite frankly immense, a hundred cover songs, something like that is amazing, but why was it so successful? What is it about the song that's so appealing? Well, personally, for me, I think it's a very happy song. It has a really nice melody. It has that nice little bit of swing quality to it. And people just like it. It's kind of one of those happy songs that make you smile. I'd say so. I think it's a, mm-hmm. I think it's a great song and a, and a great introduction to that movie, Wall Street, which is one of my favorite movies. Anyway, let's take a break, beginning okay. with an introduction to the film and television scoring of one of our friends and associates, Edgar Ahrens, an amazing Russian composer. Yes. I've worked with Russian composer Edgar Aaron for quite a few years, building an inventory of songs, many of which feature singer-performer Patricia Welch. We will soon be releasing these songs, components of an album and a musical in progress called Hadley's Castle. When Edgar and I first got together, I was amazed by the brilliance of his musical scores created for movies, TVs, and animations. Here is a sample of the work he did on the Russian TV series, available now on Amazon, called The Secret Agent's Memoir, which had two seasons. This score is called Escape and was created for the first season. I am very pleased to say that Bridge of Light Productions, a division of New Galaxy Enterprises, is proud to be the contact point for television and film companies seeking information about this amazing composer's work. If you're in the entertainment business and wish to know more, contact me at johnnybluestar at gmail.com. That's johnnybluestar at gmail.com. Boots in Manhattan is a coming-of-age novel by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. It is about a young Tom Boots Raymond who grows up in New York in the 1940s who is a member of a street gang. My friends and I were about to start our own game of stickball when Rabbit Lacey, the head of the Rattlers, came up to us and tried to move in on our game. We were called dwarves, the youngest members of the stupid gang. Hey, Kevin, I need you to get some gloves and some stuff I left at my place. No, this is our game. Hey, are you my good little dwarf or what? You've been calling me a dwarf since I was six. We're not your personal slaves, pal. Hey, what is this? A dwarf rebellion? All right, big guy. We ditch the dwarf thing. We make you guys regular rattlers. No, it's too late. He looked at Jay and me. We looked away. Rabbit was now angry, and he pushed Kevin hard with the palms of his hands. Kevin tried to ram him in the stomach, but he stepped aside, throwing Kevin into the curb where he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely at the knee. Still, he managed to get up. My street. Kevin shouted at Rabbit, pointing at him with an angry index finger. Find out more by Googling Boots in Manhattan, a 1940s coming-of-age novel, part one of the novel series The Foot Soldier by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. That's Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. Nowadays, if you are a serious business person, just getting assistance from someone with a license and a bit of experience may not be sufficient. In fact, your realtor actually needs to be knowledgeable enough to be one of your top advisors. Whether you are facilitating a giant merger or selling your company, there's a lot at stake besides your finances. There is the future value of your current investment, financial freedom, integrity, and overall reputation. If you need this kind of assistance, Sandra Laflamme is a real estate expert with the experienced reputation and knowledge qualified to assist you in all your key transactions. Sandra Laflamme, real estate services with integrity and conscience. Contact her today at 888-366-8070. That's Sandra Laflamme at 888-366-8070. We're back with Patricia Welch, who's not only an artist, but an entrepreneur and producer, who has personally created a wonderful 
three CD project called Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia that features 46 songs from decades from the 1950s to the 1990s. Tell us, Patricia, why you were motivated to produce such an ambitious album. I, I say ambitious, ambitious because you've chosen songs compelling you to record material competing with a history of fantastic number of cover songs by some of the world's greatest artists, but also intrinsically demanding the ultimate in musical and dramatic artistry. How could you do this? Well, you know, the thought came, I actually thought about all these songs that I love, first of all. I've always loved the songs spanning from the 40s into the early 90s, especially the 60s and 70s. Oh my gosh, I just love that music. So I wanted something that was easy listening, that people loved. A lot of these songs are very soothing, very easy listening. I also wanted to, to, to put a compilation of a 46-song CD set together because I thought it would make a perfect hostess gift. You know, when somebody's having, and we, I live here in Palm Desert in, in the, in the uh, Coachella Valley, and we have so many country clubs and dinner parties and galas and so forth, and a lot of people entertain here, and I just thought it would be a perfect opportunity for somebody that's having a cocktail party or a dinner party to play the music, you know, from, from the cocktail CD, then to the dinner CD, and then to the, the dessert CD, and play this th throughout the course of the evening. In fact, I actually attended a party where a hostess did this, and, <laughs> and it, where it timed out perfectly. It timed out perfectly. We were actually finishing up dessert by the time we got into the very last CD, which was the dinner, uh, the um, dessert. So it's cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia in the music for great entertaining three CD set. <laughs> that is great, uh, and 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 I believe that you can choose between dinner, dessert, and cocktails in, in your choice of the CDs if you wanted them individually. Well, actually. Um, I'll make a correction there. The CD set is sold as a whole, the three CD set. And then uh, the one that they can actually choose as a single is the dinner CD. That's the middle CD of the set. I see. So, mm -hmm. Well, here you have a tremendous number of songs during this period. I mean, you've had to choose like 46 out of hundreds. What, what, uh, what was the criteria you used to choose these songs? Well, just their favorites of mine, songs that I love to sing, anything that I felt. I, I, first of all, Johnny, I can never sing anything that I don't feel. If I don't feel it, I can't sing it. But luckily, there's a lot of good, enough good material out there, especially from the, from the past, that I can really feel. And uh, so basically, these were just all songs that I've loved to sing throughout the years. In our last selection... We played Fly Me to the Moon, a hit song by Bart Howard, which came something like 20 years after he began his musical career. Now, the following song had a brief fling for a week in the charts, reaching number 30 through the recording of Jerry Lester with the musical direction of Milton DeLug at the time. Jerry Lester was the host of a program called Broadway Open House, and it's, it, it was said that this song, first broadcast on his program, was the very first television program to effectively promote a song to the charts. Still, that wasn't really when it, when it reached its apex. Tell us about when it really became famous and its subsequent history. The name of the song is Orange Colored Sky. Tell us about when it really became famous and its subsequent history. Well, the best known version of that song was uh, recorded by Nat King Cole. And uh, so that was back in 1950. And then it reached the Billboard bestseller in 1950, and that actually lasted 13 weeks on the chart. And, you know, I really like to see the popularity of older songs coming back because, ironically, that song was so big in the 1950s. But even Lady Gaga covered the song uh, back in New York at the Oak Room in 2010. And then they actually, in 2013, a modified version was used for a jingle for a Weight Watchers commercial. <laughs> Well, that's some history, especially yeah, Lady yeah. Gaga. I think I think it was then, maybe correct me, that she wore, wore a dress made out of hair. Absolutely, yes. You got it. You got your trivia right. That's that's exactly what she wore at the Oak Room in New York City in 2010 when she sang that song. <laughs> there, there's a lot of exuberance in this song, yet with its lyrics and kind of its bouncy melody, 
your performance really captures something of the era. Did you feel you had to do a bit of time travel to capture the sense of this song? Uh, yes and no, um, you know, because it, it, it does have that era. But I think a lot of the old songs, I just honestly think that they fit today's standards as well. Maybe maybe there's going to be people that, people that disagree with me, but I think they do. Maybe I'm a little old fashioned. I don't know. <laughs> I think the language is a little bit uh, a, a little bit uh, old fashioned there. Uh, yeah, yeah. But 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 you know that doesn't keep something from being a perennially. Uh, I mean, we're still reading Charles Dickens, right? You know Absolutely. what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, it, it is something about it that sticks, and, yeah. and you can't quite destroy as time moves on. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the line in the song, one look at you and, you know, um, and, and I yelled timber, <laughs> you know, like a tree was going <laughs> to land on me. I love that. You know, I, I don't know. I think in that sense, it could fit any era, you know, because that's what happens when we fall in love, you know, boom, wham, you know, when, when you know it's, that's the right one, you know it. <laughs> I seem to recall that about three decades ago. Mm-hmm. Me too. <laughs> Walking along, minding my business, when out of an orange colored sky, flash, bam, alakazam, wonderful you came by. I was humming the tune, drinking in sunshine, when out of that orange colored view, flash, bam, alakazam. I've got to look at you Yeah, one look and I yell Timber, watch out for flying glass Cause the ceiling fell in and the bottom fell out I went into a spin and I started to shout I've been hit, this is it, this is it I was walking along Minding my business When love came and hit me in the eye Out of an orange colored sky This next song was written by one of the most famous singers of all time, Edith Piaf. Tell us a little bit about this singer. Oh, my gosh. Edith Piaf. She has such an amazing history. Uh, Edith actually was widely regarded as France's national chanteuse. uh, But the interesting thing about her life is that she was abandoned by her mother at birth. And uh, she lived a very short time with her father, who was a street acrobat. And then he joined the French army in 1916. And so there was no other person to watch her or to to care for her other than his grandmother, Emma, who actually ran a brothel. Oh, really? Yes, yes. And so Edith Piaf was raised by her grandmother and the prostitutes helped take care of her. And uh, so she, she really had an interesting life. And In 1935, she was discovered uh, by singing in a nightclub. So Edith actually performed 
in many nightclubs and brothels throughout her career. And uh, the love of her life was actually the uh, married uh, boxer Marcel Cardin, uh, but he died in a, a plane crash in October 1949. And so she's had a lot of hardships through her, her life. And then in 1951, she was seriously injured in a car crash. And thereafter, she, you know, she suffered such serious uh, difficulties arising from morphine and alcohol addictions as a result of the pain that she, you know, endured from the car crash. And so she really had a hard life. And uh, unfortunately, she died at a very young age, at age 47. But, yeah. you know, her music can be found on over 80 recordings I think that is remarkable for her short life. I can give you an example. I'm on about four recordings. <laughs> of course, I'm no Ethiopia, but I have about four recordings under my belt. And here she is, only 47 years old, and her her music can be found on over 80 recordings. And she co-wrote La Vie en Rose. A lot of people don't know that she also co-wrote that song. So, How would you characterize her style of singing? Well... Uh, actually, she just was such an emotional singer. I think her style was her emotion, and I think that's what made her so popular. I mean, she she didn't have like the greatest voice, but she had such deep emotion and feeling, and she made the audience feel the song. And did she um, have any impact on you as a performer yourself? I mean, in general, although her fame had reached very high levels before you became a professional. Yeah, I think it did. You know, after I, especially after I read her life story, first of all, it made me so grateful that I didn't have those hardships. <laughs> and then secondly, that listening to her style and her uh, emotion, always that always helps a singer. When you can see that other singers, what they're doing with the song and how they can get into the song, it makes you more, it makes me more eager to give my own personal feeling towards that, that particular story, that song, uh, the lyric, you know, because that's the mo I think that's the most important thing of a song. I mean, the music is truly beautiful and it adds to it. But, you know, if you can't sing the lyric, you're not going to sell the song. Well, let's see how you did with La Vie en Rose. Thank you. Des yeux qui font baisser la mienne, à rien qui soupère sa bouche. Voilà la porte pressant le touche de l'homme que la japantière. Comme de me prendre dans ses bras, il me parle. Thank you. 
d'amour plus fini. Au grand bonheur qui pense aux fleurs, des aimes et des chevrasses et fausses. Au rêve, au rêve, on a mouru. We are always interested in how an artist gets their first break. I think that Fane intervened to get your break in a very interesting way. Tell us how you managed to get your first chance on Broadway. Well, um, I actually took that chance in my early 20s and decided that I was going to go to New York City. And so I saved up my money. And I was a little young girl from West Virginia, so I didn't have much knowledge about what it entailed. So I went to New York with $1,400 cash. That's basically all I had thinking that that was going to last me for a long time. And after three weeks, it was gone. I didn't really know how to get around. And, you know, with between taxis and eating out and all of that, I, I didn't plan that wisely. But um, somehow, you know, fate was on my side because I was actually ready to leave New York City. And I bumped into, ironically, I, was my, I had asked my mom to just wire me a little bit more to get me through. And I was walking out of Western Union and uh, bumped, it literally bumped into an old college friend walking out of West, Western Union, bumped into her, and she recognized me, and we started talking, and she lived on the upper west side of New York City, West 99th Street, and um, we started talking, and I told her I was ready to leave the city, and I didn't think I could stay, and blah, 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 and so she said, you know, we have a two-bedroom apartment, but we have a living room and a closet in our living room. And if I could talk to my sister and see if she'll let you stay on the couch in the living room, uh, would you be, you know, would you want to stay? And I said, absolutely. I said, I'll clean, I'll cook, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, that's what happened. So she uh, made the arrangement. I was staying at the YWCA. Uh, she called me at the YWCA because we didn't have cell phones back then. This is back in 1980, you know. <laughs> So, um, so she called me and left a message there, and I went to, ended up staying at her house. And then about two weeks later, that's when they had an open call for The King and I, with wow. Yul Brenner, starring Yul Brenner, and Mitch Lee was the producer. And so I went to that open call, and then that was my success story. There were 6,000 people that auditioned for that musical, and they kept narrowing it down and narrowing it down, and they narrowed it down to uh, 10 women for the part of Tup Tim, and I was one of the ten. And I'll never forget that day when Mitch Lee called me up after the final audition, because while well, I had one audition, then we had a call back, and he, they said Yul Brenner would be back in town a few days later, and that he wanted to hear everybody. And so I actually performed for Yul Brenner uh, in for the audition, and then Mitch Lee called me up that night and said, "We we want to offer you the role of Tup Tim and the King and I." It was a Cinderella story, a true Cinderella story. Amazing. And and there was a sense of being guided. I mean, that mm -hmm. strange things happen, which you might call synchronicity, to make it work. Yes. Fate. Fate. Like like just kind of what your show is about. Threshold, you know, just that that fate thing. I mean, really, really wonderful how things happen in our lives, how people enter our lives and exit our lives at different times and how all that is sort of a storyboard of our lives. And you know, being a writer, how all of that is so true. Yeah, it's just, uh, but when it actually happens to you, mm -hmm. like it did when a Russian composer who uh, I had contacted lived in Moscow introduced me to this singer he wanted to work with, and uh, she happened to live 30 miles away from me, and that was you. And yeah. Edgar was, uh, who we worked with, together with for years, was in uh, Moscow. So it all really is a very interesting tapestry. It is. It is. Well, now we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Okay. For Christmas, why not give your family and friends something unforgettable? A cavalcade of songs, 46 of the greatest classic standards from the 1950s to the 1990s by one of the most dramatic, versatile singers alive today. Take a breath, close your eyes, but only for a moment. Here is the amazing Patricia Welch with the perfect Christmas gift for family and friends.
Music for great entertaining introduces cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia Welch. Whatever Lola wants. Three hours of continuous music, the perfect accompaniment to an elegant dinner party. 46 of the all-time classic standards, spanning decades of hit songs. Sung by Patricia Welch, a soprano with an amazing four-octave range. Take the guesswork out of what music to play at your next dinner party. Going to a friend's home for dinner? Cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia also makes the perfect hostess gift. Three hours of great music, all digitally recorded. Singer Andy Williams says, Patricia has a gorgeous voice and always thrills the audience. Las Vegas entertainer Wayne Newton is also a fan. Sometimes the sun goes around the moon. New Galaxy Enterprises is a media company specializing in wide ranging content like novels, nonfiction books, screenplays, commercial advertising, web content, etc. One of our most esteemed providers is illustrator Robert W. Zalo. I work on all my most important projects like book covers, logos, web design elements with Robert. As an illustrator, he worked on the Ignatz nominated comic book, The Expert's Guide to Killing Things That Go Bump in the Night. His skills encompass advertising, magazine illustrations, gaming, comic books, TV production, and scenic painting. His clients include Comcast, Adelphia, Haven Talent, Forceworks, High Octane Theater, Star Creative Advertising. If you wish to contact Robert, go to johnnybluestar.com and let me know. That's johnnybluestar.com for artist, illustrator Robert Zalo, an essential component of all the work we do. Maybe he can help you too. This is Johnny Blue Star. I've worked as a lyricist with Patricia Welsh for over five years, along with Russian composer Edgar Ahrens, a friend and colleague. Her ability as a singer is simply amazing. She brings a unique and dramatic flair to every song she sings. Over the next few months, we shall be releasing a number of these songs, part of an album called Hadley's Castle. Meanwhile, Patricia has been busy creating a super enjoyable collection of classic standards in an exciting 46-song, 3-CD collection. Music for great entertaining introduces cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia Welch. Three hours of continuous music. 46 of the all-time classic standards, spanning decades of hit songs. Going to a friend's home for dinner? Cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia also makes the perfect hostess gift. This three CD compilation is the perfect background music that sets just the right mood for any dinner party. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. There was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy. To purchase this album, just go to Patricia Welch dot com forward slash cd that is patriciawelch.com forward slash cd you won't be disappointed that was an astounding performance although i know almost no french the emotional power of that song including the words seemed to transcend a little thing like language did you study piaf's own performance a great deal before you developed your own version what did you try to convey in your way of uh, reproducing the song I did study her version as well as many other French singers. Um, Sophie Millman was one that I kind of, that's basically her musical track version is kind of like I patterned my track version after that. But um, for me, I don't speak any French. And it's funny because I was performing that at a concert and a Frenchman came up to me and just started talking to me in fluent French afterwards. <laughs> really? 
And <laughs> so he, he said, your French, is, your French is so magnificent. And I said, well, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the Internet nowadays and, you know, being able to grab stuff off of iTunes and Amazon and so forth and listening to other, and YouTube and listening to other singers. What I do when I work on a song from a different language is I phonetically write it out and then I pattern those words phonetically and somehow I seem to be right on by doing that. So that's a little tip for you singers out there. <laughs> well, that was an amazing, amazing performance. Thank you. I know how rough it is to try and break through into, in, into show business. And although the following hit song is a love song, I think it acknowledges some of the feelings one has when one is longing to arrive at an eagerly expected goal and the many challenges that one feels as one proceeds on one's way. Let's hear this song from Patricia's three-part CD, Cocktail, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia, Come In From The Rain. such a long, long time. There's so much to say. No need to explain. Just an open door for you to come in from the rain. It's a long road when you're on your own. And a man like you will always choose the long way home There's no right or wrong I'm not here to blame I just want to be the one Who keeps you from the rain Coming from the rain And it looks like older and wiser I know I am And it's good to know my best friend has come home again Cause I think of us like an old it doesn't matter Cause I love you Anyway Coming from The rain How would you describe the emotional ambiance of coming from the rain, Patricia? Oh, wow. It, uh, you know, I think we all have the storyline, you know, it's we all have a friend that's kind of wandered off or drifted. And basically the story is that she's welcoming him, welcoming, welcoming her friend back into her, her arms, into her life. And uh, so in that sense, it has a wonderful emotional 
impact. I've always liked that song. And, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the song was actually recorded by Melissa Manchester. It was written by um, Carol Bayer Sager, but it was also recorded by uh, Captain Antonio and Diana Ross. A lot of other people covered that song. So that's another one of those popular songs. Well, here's, a, here's another song with a very opposite mood. It actually is a song I hum to myself when I might have an occasional victory. It's called Top of the World. Such a feeling's coming over me There is wonder most everything I see Not a cloud in the sky Got the sun in my eyes And I won't be surprised if it's a dream Everything I want the world to be Is now coming true Especially for me And the reason is it's because you are here You're the nearest thing to heaven that I've seen I'm on the top of the world Looking down on creation And the only explanation I can find Is the love that I've found Ever since you've been around Your love's put me at the top of the world Something in the wind has learned my name And it's telling me that things are not the same In the leaves on the trees and the touch of the breeze There's a pleasing sense of happiness for me There is only one wish on my mind when this day is through, I hope that I will find That tomorrow will be just the same for you and me All I need will be mine if you are here I'm on the top of the world looking down on creation And the only explanation I can find is the love Love's put me at the top of the world I'm on the top of the world Looking down on creation I'm the only explanation I can find Is the love that I've found Ever since you've been around Your love's put me at the top of the world Your love's put me at the top of the world your love's put me at the top of the world. Patricia, you seem to impart so much of a different ambiance to each song. It seems to me like you're constantly taking, in, taking on very different personas. And although your voice is highly recognizable, it, is, it almost seems like you're a character actor playing different parts. How do you determine the dramatic quality you bring to each song? Well, you know, I, I do. I do feel the different parts and the different songs and the different storylines and also the different rhythms and so forth of the song. And I kind of feel a, a little bit like a chameleon. I do like to put on all those different colors. And, you know, the fact that I have four, a four octave range, I think, also helps it because uh, I can color the voice in different ways and give a different dramatic quality to the song, depending on what type of song it is and what the story is about that song. You know, when you see Dustin Hoffman as an example of a character actor uh, work, you, you do recognize him. I mean, you know what he looks like, and his voice is somewhat the same, but he, nonetheless, there's that magic of taking on a different part uh, and, and you, a different personality, and it's kind of an amazing thing. And I think that that is something... It is a gift that you have that's extremely rare, and uh, I know very well how versatile you are. So it is amazing to me. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate that. Now, here's another song 
called Night and Day, a song that really began in the 1930s in a musical called Gay Divorce. It was written by Cole Porter, and having become a signature song of his was the title of a biopic about him, that is a biography in film. I suppose it may be the oldest song in your collection, but it certainly got a fresh start with Frank Sinatra in 1942, who apparently liked it so much that he recorded it four more times. But it's got an even richer history than that, doesn't it? It sure does. It's a, it's a great song. And uh, I like, you know, the song is done also in different versions. Like some people do it a little slower. Some people do it a little faster. On my recording, it's more like a bossa nova. And I kind of like that quality to the song. So um, I've always enjoyed singing that. You know, I also enjoy the range, too. It's a little bit deeper, kind of a, in my deeper part of my range. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's listen to it. Let's hear Night and Day okay. with Patricia Welch. Okay. Thanks so much for being with us for the first half of this program. We'll return in five minutes with more from the most famous songs of decades past from an album called Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia Welch. Available now at patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. That's patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. Patricia will be joining us live in five minutes. Stay tuned. This is Johnny Blue Star. Welcome to Threshold a global media event. Is the universe just a random dance of atoms, or is it a manifestation of a supremely intelligent architect? Can its purpose, or our purpose here on Earth, be adequately assessed? 
Can we commune with it, know its intentions, cooperate with its direction? Here, we define threshold as a gateway state of awareness, allowing mankind to cross into a place of real cognition. Threshold allows us to approach questions of higher reality through the door of experience rather than mere belief. Welcome to Threshold, where we tear away the veil from commercial media, bringing our audience and participants into another realm of reality and enhanced communication. There is nothing more exciting for me than to work in collaboration with various artists and perhaps one of the most enjoyable experiences I've ever had is collaborating with Russian composer Edgar Ahrens and today's guest, singer-performer Patricia Welch. Our work together is available now on YouTube with a song called Christmas in Your Eyes. Edgar is now doing the final mix down on our next song for YouTube uh, called The Palm Springs Lullaby. Her son Anthony is slated to direct the video. It must be exciting to see your son also develop into an artist, in his case with his eye on directing. Absolutely. Um, Anthony's sort of, he's always kind of had that artistic side. And uh, he actually went to uh, San Francisco and he has his degree in cinematography. And so he has a lot of knowledge. He also has such a creative flow. He really has great ideas. And I think he's a little bit of a musician on the side, too. He's, he dabbles. He's not a professional, but he really, you know, he's self-taught. He plays the guitar. He sings. He could be if he wanted to be, but, I, you know, he's got his degree in cinematography, so he's busy with that. But, um, but he, you know, I think, as I said earlier, once you're involved in the arts, you're kind of involved in the arts all the way around. You know, I know me, like you're a writer, Johnny, for example, the courses that I did well in school, in high school and college, were the more artistic related courses like literature and anything that was more arts minded. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do I didn't do too well in the sciences and the math and things like that. So I think if you have a real artistic side, it stays with you, you know, and that's that's my, my son has like, maybe he's inherited a little bit of that from me. I don't know. But he does definitely have that artistic side. Well, that's great. You know, I, I want you to go over something that we mentioned before in the first hour about your album, Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia. What is the story, a little bit more about the backstory behind the title? Music for Great Entertaining is actually the, the title. Ah. And, and, uh, but Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia are the, the three facets of the of the three CD set. You know, we have a cocktail CD, a dinner CD, and a dessert CD. And the whole idea is that it would be a great gift, hostess gift for people that just want to play music for three hours and have soothing background music. Uh, nothing overwhelming, nothing too intrusive, but just pretty music and music that people love. P music, songs that, you know, I think just about every song on this CD was a big hit at one point. And so I tried to choose songs that people could fam be familiar with and hum along. Well, I have to say, not only are they, they all familiar songs, but they're all very different from each other and so very exciting to listen to. You know, we're going to play another song soon. Like, like Fly Me to the Moon, which had a renaissance in the film Wall Street, the following song had a renaissance in the film Ghost, which was a beautiful beginning to a very funny yet very profound film, I believe. Here is Patricia Welch in Unchained Melody.
seems to me this couldn't be the easiest song in the world to sing. Was that the case? Um, well, it's easy for me because I have the four octaves. But let me tell you a little kind of story, a funny story. I actually performed the song. I live in La Quinta, California, and I performed the song at La Quinta Country Club. And uh, back then, that was a few years back, Andy Williams attended a private party that I sang this song at. And oh. he nudged a, a gentleman next to him when I started singing the song. And he said, she'll never get to the end of that song in this high key. I started it in a G, which is, <laughs> which is and, and, and I kind of really go up. You'll, you'll hear when you play the song, I go way up uh, with uh, some of the notes in that song. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he was really quite impressed and surprised that I was even able to sing the song in that key. And he very graciously, very sweetly um, put a nice testimonial, by the way, on my cocktail, dinner, and dessert CD. I have two great testimonials from two great singers, well-known singers, Andy Williams, one, and Wayne Newton. They both gave me excellent testimonials uh, that's actually on this back of the CD, which I was, I'm so grateful and thankful for um, that two greats took the time to write something about my voice and about the CD. Well, it is a fabulous rendition. Uh, you know, the song itself, you know, we, we think of the name of the song, Unchained Melody, but it actually started out as a theme for a prison movie called Unchained. But the singer of that song, Todd Duncan, did not carry it as far as other singers. Tell us a little more about its history. That's true. It was, it, Unchained was the movie, and uh, and it didn't really gain its popularity until um, the Righteous Brothers, Bobby Hatfield, uh, in, back in 1965, uh, he recorded it, and um, it just re received such great popularity. And then, of course, after the blockbuster film Ghost, more popularity. Here's how our listeners can acquire your CD, which could be, for many lucky people, the perfect gift. This is Johnny Blue Star. I've worked as a lyricist with Patricia Welch for over five years, along with Russian composer Edgar Ahrens, a friend and colleague. Her ability as a singer is simply amazing. She brings a unique and dramatic flair to every song she sings. Over the next few months, we shall be releasing a number of these songs, part of an album called Hadley's Castle. Meanwhile, Patricia has been busy creating a super enjoyable collection of classic standards in an exciting 46-song, 3-CD collection. Music for Great Entertaining introduces cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia Welch. Three hours of continuous music. 46 of the all-time classic standards spanning decades of hit songs. Going to a friend's home for dinner? Cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia also makes the perfect hostess gift. This three CD compilation is the perfect background music that sets just the right mood for any dinner party. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. To purchase this album, just go to patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. That is patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. You won't be disappointed. It is the 15th century. El Tesoro de Cielo, a Spanish treasure ship, sends a scouting expedition to a strange island. Golden statues surrounding them prove the enormity of their find. Suddenly, hordes of ghoulish creatures with scaly green flesh and skeletal wings descend upon them from the sky. What do you think of this, Rufio? These creatures are fragile, Captain. We could take them with our swords. They seem supernatural. Who knows what powers they possess? Fallen angels weakened by their treason. By God! Are you saying they're Nephilim, the devil's host? I'm saying whatever they are, we can take them. Do any of you cowards dare join me? Up against sharp knife-like nails and hideous fangs, the men's swords rip into slimy green flesh. Though black blood pours copiously from their half-naked bodies, creatures miraculously persist. Can the crew survive this bloody, cursed battle? 
Find out more by Googling The Thrice Born, a new sci-fi supernatural novel by Carlos Lopez Avery and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Carlos Johnny Kindle, The Thrice Born. That's Carlos Johnny Kindle, The Thrice Born. Now, coming up is a song written by Burt Bacharach, originally for the 1968 musical Promises, Promises, but that wasn't the end of it. Even though it was nominated for a Grammy but failed to grab the Golden Ring, later on, Diane Warwick made some headway in Billboard with it, but finally it moved to international status as a gigantic bestseller. Let's play it. I'll never fall in love again. That's what you get for all your trouble I'll never fall in love again I'll never fall in love again What do you get when you kiss a guy? You get enough germs to catch pneumonia After you do, he'll never phone ya I'll never fall in love again Don't you know that I'll never fall in love again? Don't tell me what it's all about Cause I've been there and I'm glad I'm out Out of those chains, those chains that bind you That is why I'm here to remind you What do you get when you fall in love? You only get lies and pain and sorrow So for at least until tomorrow I'll never fall in love again No, no, I'll never fall in love again chains, those chains that bind you, that is why I'm here to remind you what do you get when you fall in love, you only get lies and pain and sorrow so for at least until tomorrow I'll never fall in love again don't you know that I'll never fall in love again This is kind of a bittersweet song. Could it be um, that it's many people's recurring experience? (laughs) I think many people can relate to that. Well, I I, I do think that Burt Bacharach, the songwriter, in writing this, did keep his sense of humor, right? Yes. Actually, Burt Bacharach wrote the music, and Hal David was the actual lyricist. Uh, But uh, there is a little bit of trivia behind this song. Do you want to hear it? Of course. Okay. Well, actually, Burt Bacharach, had just come out of the hospital. He was very sick with pneumonia. And uh, so Hal David wrote the the lyric, I'll never fall in love again, the lyrics to this, and he added the line about pneumonia, which rhymes with phonia. Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. And so, and actually the the song was originally written for the 1968 musical Promises, Promises. But I just thought that was interesting that Burt Bacharach had pneumonia. He was very sick with it, actually. He was in the hospital. And, you know, back then people could die from pneumonia. They can today even. Yes, they can. And uh, so it was very serious. But uh, how David, he said he subconsciously put through that in. But I wonder if that was influenced by his friend, dear friend, Burt Bacharach, just getting out of the hospital. <laughs> Interesting story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you shared the stage with Robert Goulet when he toured in Man and His Music. Both of you got your start in Broadway. You were playing with Yul Brynner as his unhappy wife, Tipton, in The King and I. And uh, Goulet, by playing Sir Lancelot in Camelot, 
What was it like working with him? Did you feel a commonality in your experience of struggling performers in the past, which you both were? Well, first of all, Robert Goulet was such a remarkable, remarkable person and friend. He became my friend after I started working with him. He always called me kid. He'd say, are you ready to go, kid? Mm-hmm. You know, when we have rehearsals or whatever. And uh, he was a very down-to-earth guy. You know, he was... He didn't act like a star. You know, I mean, he was a star, but he didn't act like what people think of as, you know. He was very, very, very sweet, loved to tell jokes. He would tell jokes to the band members, to the crew people, right before getting on stage. And uh, when I was on stage with him, one of the microphones blew a trance, blew a, uh, the capsule and the mic blew. And so I didn't have a mic. And he came over. We were singing a duet together. And we're sharing Mike back and forth, and he's handing me his mic. I mean, he was just such a sweetheart. I really miss him, and uh, and a lot of times when I do live shows, I try to do the impossible dream and, and you know, end that with talking about Robert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A terrific uh, person. Mm-hmm. The next song has a quite unique history, and uh, it's called Nature Boy. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Nature Boy? The, the song and 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 who wrote it? Yes, actually, the the song "Nature Boy" was written by Eden Abez, and he was an American songwriter, uh, recording artist. Back he said, you know, he he wrote the song. He originally recorded it back in the 1940s to the 1960s. But his lifestyle in California was influential on the hippie movement. You know, one of the th- interesting things about Eden Abez is that, as I said, he was part of the hippie movement even before it was a hippie movement back in the 1940s, uh, but he traveled in sandals, he wore shoulder length hair, he had a beard, he wore, wore long white robes. He and his family even camped out uh, in front of the Hollywood sign above Los Angeles. And um, he slept outdoors with his family, he ate vegetables and fruits and nuts. And and the song I think is so fitting for him because it, he was truly a nature boy. Well, let's hear this song, Nature Boy.
One magic day he passed my way And while we spoke of many things Fools and kings This he said to me The greatest thing You know, believe it or not, Patricia, I have sort of a connection to this guy. You do? And what is that? <laughs> well, you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but in Palm Springs, I had um, several programs that were devoted to a holistic medicine. And one of the people that I had on often was an older man named Gypsy Boots, whose name is actually mentioned in the Wikipedia article about uh, Abes. And Gypsy Boots, <laughs> well, he was in his probably his 70s at the time, and I interviewed him with his cousin. They were working as spokespeople for Kyolic Garlic, <laughs> which oh. is odorless garlic, uh -huh. as, as, as a kind of, uh, you know, tremendously medicinal herb, um, and, and, which was developed by Wakanaga of America, which was a Japanese country that had a... Had a uh, had an organization here. So I, I interviewed him many, many times on Nature's Workshop and um, Journey to Wellness, which are the two programs. He used to f go outside and throw this football really hard and at really long distances and, you know, kind of play with his cousin out there. Uh, he was into raw foods and vegetables. And he knew everyone during that period, um, like the, the founders of the natural health movement, people like Paul Bragg, who founded the first health food store in America, whose name is associated with fitness leaders also like Jack LaLanne and Bernard McFadden. So tell us about how Abbas convinced a very famous singer, somewhat obliquely, to listen to the song. You know, I really don't know how he did that. I don't know the history on that. Ah. But I do, I do know that Abbas, he was very, very shy. You know, he did not want to be like, in front of any cameras. He didn't want to be in the limelight. He really, really was uh, very, you know, he had the money, but as I said, he lived off of the land. He was very, just a very unusual guy. And I, as I said earlier, I think he just fits that song so well. But well, I don't know how he convinced, I don't know the story behind that. Well, part. the story is that uh, in 1947, Abes was, went to a performance by Nat King Cole. And uh, he wanted to present the, story, the song to him, but he, he couldn't do it. So he left a copy with Cole's valet. And, um, and later on, uh, you know, Cole actually looked at it. And he, started to, he actually started to, uh, to play it at his performances. But really? He, but he couldn't, he couldn't find the guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he looked all over for him. And... Um, I believe what happened was that he found him, you know, network to, to find out where he was and found him sleeping under the Hollywood sign. Yes. And he was like, uh, you know, like a very strange person, but that song had tremendous, uh, tremendous power to it. It does. So, it has a great message, too. It does. And as a matter of fact, Lady Gaga sang that one, too. I don't know if she was wearing a hair shirt or not. Oh. <laughs> Maybe it was from uh, the leftovers of his beard or something. I, I didn't know. realize she sang that. Yeah. Well, um, so, that, so that was kind of an amazing little connection that we had. Interesting. Now, I, I think one thing that I think is uh, important, uh, since we're talking, we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of love songs here in this album, and the, one of the things the song states is uh, the greatest thing 
is to be loved and to love in return. Quite a different attitude than uh, I'll never love again. Yes, absolutely. And I think that is, that's a, he, he, he sort of was like a philosopher, wasn't he? He sort of was a philosopher. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was involved actually with, with a guy named Bill Pastor who introduced him to Nathermensch and Lebens, Lebensreform philosophies, which was basically, a, a you know, it was a, a sort of like a hippie philosophy. Mm -hmm. It was uh, basically return to nature. And, and Gypsy Boots also followed that philosophy, I think, uh, t you know, to the end of his days. Now, why did you actually choose it? Mm. I've always liked it. I like, I, I like the message. I like the melody. I like just, it's just one of the, one, another one of my favorites, you know, I just, um, I thought it'd be fitting for the CD project. Yeah, it is. It's it's mm -hmm. it's something though that has a sort of an original, simple but powerful message too. That's right. It's kind of like the rose. The rose has that too. That's also on my CD project. But same thing it has that wonderful message about life and you know what what it's all about. Well, we're going to go to our break now. Okay. I've worked with Russian composer Edgar Aaron for quite a few years, building an inventory of songs, many of which feature singer-performer Patricia Welch. We will soon be releasing these songs, components of an album and a musical in progress called Hadley's Castle. When Edgar and I first got together, I was amazed by the brilliance of his musical scores created for movies, TVs, and animations. Here is a sample of the work he did on the Russian TV series, available now on Amazon, called The Secret Agent's Memoir, which had two seasons. This score is called Escape and was created for the first season. I am very pleased to say that Bridge of Light Productions, a division of New Galaxy Enterprises, is proud to be the contact point for television and film companies seeking information about this amazing composer's work. If you're in the entertainment business and wish to know more, contact me at johnnybluestar at gmail.com. That's johnnybluestar at gmail.com. New Galaxy Enterprises is a media company specializing in wide-ranging content like novels, non-fiction books, screenplays, commercial advertising, web content, etc. One of our most esteemed providers is illustrator Robert W. Zalo. I work on all my most important projects like book covers, logos, web design elements with Robert. As an illustrator, he worked on the Ignatz-nominated comic book, The Expert's Guide to Killing Things That Go Bump in the Night. His skills encompass advertising, magazine illustrations, gaming, comic books, TV production, and scenic painting. His clients include Comcast, Adelphia, Haven Talent, Forceworks, High Octane Theater, Star Creative Advertising. If you wish to contact Robert, go to johnnybluestar.com and let me know. That's johnnybluestar.com. For artist, illustrator Robert Zalo, an essential component of all the work we do. Maybe he can help you too. Boots in Manhattan is a coming-of-age novel by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. It is about a young Tom Boots Raymond who grows up in New York in the 1940s who is a member of a street gang. My friends and I were about to start our own game of stickball when Rabbit Lacey, the head of the Rattlers, came up to us and tried to move in on our game. We were called dwarves, the youngest members of this stupid gang. Hey, Kevin, I need you to get some gloves and some stuff I left at my place. No, this is our game. Hey, are you my good little dwarf or what? You've been calling me a dwarf since I was six. We're not your personal slaves, pal. Hey, what is this? A dwarf rebellion? All right, big guy. We ditched the dwarf thing. We make you guys regular rattlers. No, it's too late. He looked at Jay and me. We looked away. Rabbit was now angry, and he pushed Kevin hard with the palms of his hands. 
Kevin tried to ram him in his stomach, but he stepped aside, throwing Kevin into the curb where he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely at the knee. Still, he managed to get up. My street. Kevin shouted at Rabbit, pointing at him with an angry index finger. Find out more by Googling Boots in Manhattan, a 1940s coming-of-age novel, part one of the novel series The Foot Soldier by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. That's Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. Now, several times in your life, you've been involved with shows connected to Las Vegas. One was with the Magic Night of Music with the famous producer and baritone Grant Griffin and another time with the legendary Mr. Las Vegas himself. Tell us something about these two phases of your life and your connection to the world of Las Vegas. Well, uh, my husband and I lived in Las Vegas, so that made it easy. But um, Grant Griffin, he he, he is still singing. He's a wonderful baritone, still has his pipes. I mean, just great, great voice. And he found me through a organization that we had in Las Vegas called Back then it was called the Cast Inc. Now it's dissolved into the Showbiz Society, but it's a kind of an organization for entertainers. And we met monthly for luncheons and so forth. And Grant met me through that. And he says, I'm putting this show together and I think you'd be perfect for it. And so I was sort of the legit end of the show. He had uh, four divas in the show with him. He had a Latino singer. He had a, bel- a real true belter, myself, and then him. He was the star. And we all kind of worked together with Grant to be part of his show. And it was a great show. And he had a sold out performance at the Orleans. And uh, it was a lot of fun to be a part of that show. And then of course with Wayne Newton. um, Mr. Las Vegas. Yes, Mr. Las Vegas, Wayne Newton. uh, I toured with him uh, for two years. I also performed with him in Las Vegas. And uh, he was a fun guy, too. And Wayne is a family man. He has his entire family, as many stars do. I don't know if people know this, but a lot of stars have their families that travel with them and are a big part of their their career. And, like, he had his mother-in-law actually selling concessions. His sister-in-law handled tickets. I mean, uh, his wife was managed him. I mean, they a lot of people that are involved in the arts have family members. I think that's what keeps them going. And the true success stories are the ones that do have their families right there on board with them. I think it's such an important part of that. That is very interesting information. Mm-hmm. 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 Of course, most of these famous songs, including all the ones on your album, most of them deal with love in one way or another. The next one is not ambivalent about love. This is a song about what happens when one truly loses someone one someone one loves it's called ooh baby baby I've known I've 
just about at the end of my road, but I can't stop trying. I can't give up hope, 'cause I'll be here someday. I'll hold you near, whisper I still love you until. I would say a very sad song. Tell us about this song. It was originally written by Smokey Robinson and Pete Moore in 1965. Yes, it actually achieved its greatest commercial success when Linda Ronstadt covered the song in 1978, and the song has been covered many, many times over the years. Linda Ronstadt's version reached number two on the adult contemporary chart and peaked number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1979, and. This is the one song on my CD that I actually was not fully. Pre- I'm Virgo, and I always prepare for everything, but I didn't feel fully comfortable with this song when I went into the studio. Ironically, by the time I got out of the studio, I feel like it's one of my best vocal recordings on my CD project. I just wasn't really quite ready for it, but by the time I recorded it and we we did it, it just something just magic happened in the studio, and it. It worked. <laughs> we kind of count on that sometimes, don't mm-hmm. we? I notice that many songs, when first recorded, do not reach their success initially, but sometimes have to be covered one or more times. Sometimes many more than that. Why do you think that is? You know, I don't know the mystery behind that, but um, sometimes it's the popularity of the artist that recorded it, maybe that made it a big hit. Um, sometimes it's the exposure that they had. You know, if they had some national television exposure, or the right marketing with their record companies, you know, I think there's a lot involved in, you know, that's why they call it the music business. But、um, I think that you know sometimes something doesn't make it make a big success until ten or twelve, fifteen years later. We see that all the time. We see that even with、uh, Broadway shows. Sometimes they're not like. They're not a big hit. They take or getting a Broadway show, getting a show on Broadway. Sometimes it takes ten or fifteen years for it to develop into something. So, so although we we're looking at fate and the thread of fate weaving through things, it's not often the、uh, intrinsic quality of the song, but a much more complicated process involving business promotion and all these other elements, right? Absolutely. Now another song that matured over a period of time, as far as the charts go, was "Wind Beneath My Wings." Here's your version of it. It must have been cold there in my shadow. Have sunlight on your face. You were content to let me shine. That's your way. You always walked a step behind. So I was the one with all the glory. Strength, a beautiful face without a name for so long. A beautiful smile to hide the pain. Did you ever know that you're my hero? And everything. Beneath. 
beneath my wings It might have appeared to go unnoticed But I've got it all here in my heart you to know I know the truth of course I know I would be nothing without you did you ever know that you're my hero and everything I would like Beneath my wings There seems to be an endless number of singers who covered this song, but it was, it was Betty Midler who won out at the end. Give us a picture of this song's movement towards a standard classic. Before you actually record it, whose performance did you like best? Well, actually, I did like Bette Midler's performance the best. I think she really did the song so well. Now, my version is almost exactly like Bette Midler's, except that my arranger, Marty Steele, when I did my CD project, 
kind of threw a little added, uh, extra tagline in on every verse. You'll hear it when you hear the song. So, you know, it basically, the audience has heard that, that there's this extra tagline. And um, I enjoyed singing it because it is a love song. And uh, it also fits so many. I've sung it actually for big events, also for like Amway and corporate things. People like that because there's always someone that is a driving force behind either a career or, um, you know, in, in one's life. And so I think we all have somebody that's the wind beneath our wings. Terrific. Thank you. Well, Thank you for coming to our show, Patricia. You've been very busy recently. Tell us a little bit about your recent activities. How can our listeners get your album, and what other music of yours is available to the public? Okay. Uh, basically, they can get my album on my website at patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. So it's patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. And Welch is with a C-H, not an S. A lot of people get that confused, but patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. And um, I have, uh, basically that's the, the CD project that I'm marketing right now. I have some older recordings and so forth, but that's the one that I'm marketing right now. And uh, I think it's my best, you know, you, as we move on through the years, we are best. My CD project, the last one that I've done, Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia, Music for Great Entertaining, is I'm proudest of that because it has the music that I love. It has uh, I spent I spent nine months working day and night on that project. I mean, a lot of people don't realize the time that goes involved in it, but uh, I would spend literally 14 hours a day working on the songs for that uh, project every single day for nine months to get that completed. Many many hours of homework and then in the studio. Yes, that's an amazing a, a lot of work, and I know mm -hmm. what you mean because I was even just writing lyrics with a composer. Mm -hmm. Me, it requires going over and over and over things until it's perfect, or you think it is. Absolutely. Special thanks to my guest, colleague, and friend Patricia Welch, and also to Edgar Aarons for their music. Thanks to the owners of Vegas on that radio who are making radio come alive again, a voice of liberty in the wilderness of a media desert. Particular thanks to John Stiles, Ryan, and Irma for their helping. And finally, an homage to the great Hassan Khan, who has helped me with the websites, YouTube promotions, commercials, and many other elements supporting the show. Subscribe to Threshold Radio at youtube.com forward slash Threshold Radio, and have a nice week. We're saying goodbye with Whatever Lola Wants, written for the musical Damn Yankees and sang on Patricia Welch's three CD set, Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia, the ultimate background music for your next dinner party. And have a great week. See you later, Patricia. Thank you very much, Johnny. It's a pleasure being part of your radio show. Give in.